Tanks have always made up a huge part of any RPG game's party composition. Standing in the face of the damage, they divert attention away from their more delicate party members. In this video today, I want to show you my favorite tank build for Baldur's Gate 3, utilizing both Paladin and Cleric with some really fun reactive items that will trigger every round to keep our bad boy sturdy. Just a note up front, there's no real conventional tanking in this game. You can't really force enemies to attack you like a taunt per se, but you can make it so that your character is hard as nails to kill. The AI will oftentimes favor the closest enemy to them unless they can actively reach a character that's further away. I guess the real way to tank is basically having someone that's 30 feet away from the entire party, so the AI has to decide if they dash out to your other party members or just attack the tank. But if this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge of my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. So with that being said, this build is going to be pretty simple. Uh, we'll be taking six levels of Ancient's Paladin, followed by six levels of Light Cleric in that order. Both of these classes will allow us a ton of survivability as well as party utility. The only tricky thing with this build is that we will be doing a respec at level 11. So jump to the Ability Points chapter if you want a quick breakdown of how we'll be approaching the respec, but that's the TLDW of this entire video. So that's all you want. if that's all you wanted to know, please feel free to shut the video down and get back to enjoying your Juggernaut tank in Baldur's Gate 3. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if this video was helpful. Each one of those things helps me out in a huge way. And if you need help with any other subject in Baldur's Gate 3, check out my playlist linked below and at the end of the video. Lastly, if you're planning on playing Dragon's Dogma 2, I have a massive rollout planned with a big content plan. So if you'd like to support the channel, you can pre-purchase the game if, if you're in that kind of thing. Don't feel pressured to do that. I can wait for reviews if you want. But you can do uh, you can use my uh, Capcom affiliate link in the description and pinned comment if you want to help support the channel. But let's get started here on my ultimate tank build for Baldur's Gate 3. Jumping right into character creation, when it comes to the race, as always, it's a single player narrative game. Have fun, choose a race that makes sense for you. Do not feel, feel like you have to play a specific one to min-max this. I'm just going to go through some of the ones that I really like. So, for example, here the Tiefling. I always really like Tieflings. Um, they get Hellish Resistance here, so they're going to start off with a Resistance to Fire, which is going to be cool. It's the most common damage type in the game. And as far as the sub-races go, I think, you know, I, I always bring this up, but... Um, I always discourage people from playing the Zariel Tiefling, but it's like thematically my favorite Tiefling, so <laughs> I hate it. But the Asmodeus and Mephistopheles Tieflings, I like the cantrips that you get from them, versus the Zariel Tiefling is going to get Branding and Searing Smite, which are two things that you are already going to get as a Paladin. And on top of it, I don't really like those Smites because they cost an action and a bonus action and oftentimes concentration. So it can be nice because they won't take up a spell slot when you use them so there's that kind of trade-off there and this can be nice since it is a close combat character but you know go with whatever makes sense for you um as far as other options here i really like and i almost never recommend dwarfs uh, like specifically the non-dwegar but the gold dwarf is really good here because we want to have as many hit points as possible and dwarven toughness does deliver that to us the dwegar though is also a really good option here because of that resilience now to um uh, against illusions and being charmed or paralyzed, as well as just the native dwarf resistance to poison. But they also get an enlarge ability so they can do more damage in close combat. So either one of these dwarfs, you can't go wrong here. Um, also, another really good one is going to always be the half orc for any melee-oriented character because of their savage attacks capability to uh, add an extra dice of weapon damage when they critical hit, which is absolutely juicy because you are also going to be doing smites with your critical hits, so you can really have a lot of fun with this. And as for a tank, this is probably one of the best things about them. They get Relentless Endurance here. If you reach zero hit points, you regain one hit point instead of becoming downed. I, I just love that. It's so thematic for this style of build, and you really can't go wrong here. Dragonborn are also always, always fun to get access to a breath weapon, which will scale with your wep your weapon, <laughs> with your level, and always be really good. But I'll always recommend the Gith because the Gith have really great cantrips across a mage hand and an enhanced leap and a misty step, but they also get access to this special ability here, Astral Knowledge, so they'll gain proficiency in all skills of a chosen ability until long rest. So you can say, hey, you know what? Maybe I want uh, a little bit more wisdom or intelligence uh, with astral knowledge so that I can maybe pass some of those harder to do checks. But again, go with whatever race makes sense for you. Uh, just for this point of the video, I'll, I'll use Gold Dwarf because why the hell not? 
Class is, of course, going to be Paladin here. We're going to be looking at stuff like Lay on Hands to have a, a source of healing with the character. But we also get Divine Sense to gain advantage on attack rolls against Celestials, Fiends, and Undead. But our big thing is the Oath of Ancients. Now, I like the Oath of Ancients the most of the three Paladin class subclasses because of this. Healing Radiance is awesome because you're going to heal yourself and all nearby allies within 10 feet for five hit points. And then the next turn, that triggers again. It's a bonus action and it's simply a channel oath charge, which is going to replenish on a short rest. It's a really great resource. And simply that it uses a bonus action, you can do all the big cool stuff in your round and then still get a good heal off. And you're going to see... With heals with this character, it's a real big driving force for what we're going to be doing. It's going to buff up people and really keep you alive. So this is a really big thing. Keep in mind, though, this is a paladin. And with paladins, you have to deal with their oath. And what that means is you can't break it or else you become an oath breaker and you got to pay a thousand gold and then more and more and more, blah, 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 blah. The oath of the ancients is probably of the three. Uh, I don't want to say the easiest because the oath of vengeance is always like take the lesser of two evils. But the oath of the ancients is pretty easy not to break. But it also, you might get like tripped up. Like if you let the hag go to get the hag's hair, for example, you're going to break your oath. So you have to kind of navigate this or be okay with breaking the oath at some points and just pay your way through it. Like the hag hair, for example, I'll break the oath gladly to get that plus one to my ability score and just pay it off. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. I deliberately made it that way so it wouldn't be a spoil for you. Into your background, as always, guys, please choose the one that makes sense for the, for the role play you have in mind for your character. Choose a role play. Make something up in your head to kind of really sink into this character to enjoy it. The background is how you're going to get inspirations for the character. You have up to four inspirations you'll get, and they'll allow you to do re-rolls on any kind of critical failures or anything of the sort. I always recommend Guild Artisan as a min-max option because it gives you insight and persuasion. But you know what? Maybe uh, this is like my favorite one to say. You're a noble son who joined the Paladin Order. Or maybe you're some outlander from a wayward um, uh, Paladin Order that has now gone to time and you still have the Oath of the Ancients because it's some sort of ancient order that, 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 that whatever, for whatever reason, you're a part of it. Or maybe you're a former soldier that has joined into a Paladin Order or a charlatan who has reformed their ways. Or you're a folk hero, and that's how you joined into the Oath of the Ancients as a way to, to protect the common folk. Whatever it is, please choose a background that makes sense for you and your character. And then as far as skills go, um, if you know if you go with like Guild Artisan, you kind of have a lot of the bases already checked, which is Insight and Persuasion. But I'm just going to choose... That'll do. So those are ones we can't get na natively. So with our two skill points, I'm definitely actually probably going to put persuasion and insight because they're just so damn good uh, but if you want to go with more of a rough and tumble kind of paladin you know go with intimidation the nice thing is you're going to be a charisma based character and if this is your face character your main character just choose one of the conversation uh, skills and stick with it because you have such a high bonus to your charisma you'll, you won't really need to worry about it and your insight I love this because insight's one of those ones that when you're doing a lot of stuff in the game, you can miss things, and insight's a really nice skill proficiency to have. Uh, another alternative here would be athletics, since you are kind of a tankier character. Being able to resist being pushed is going to be nice, but also being able to shove people back is also going to be a really cool portion of the character. So jumping into our ability points, what we're actually going to focus on is dexterity. That's going to be our primary damage form. We're going to choose finesse, long swords, and that's what we're going to stick with. You can go with strength instead, but the reason we're focusing harder on dexterity here is that dexterity is going to increase our armor class. I honestly don't necessarily care about the amount of melee damage this character can do. If it does do melee damage, that's great. We will have forms of damage that we can do in the forms of spirit guardians later into the build. But by and large, this character is going to kind of be there to supplement and support and, and buff and do all those kinds of things. By leaning into dexterity and choosing finesse weapons, like the Falara Luve, which we get in Act 1 anyway, we'll have a weapon that is a finesse weapon that can do damage and scale with our dexterity as it is. So we're pretty much good there. We have strength here at 12 because if we do want to go into a little bit of, um, what's it called, strength weapons, we can. We're not going to do a ton of damage, but at the beginning of the game, you're not going to have a ton of finesse weapons to take advantage of until you really focus on it, right? And on top of it, we're wearing heavy armor. So having to not deal with your character's encumbrance all the time, especially if they're your main character, I don't know. To me, that's crucial. You can use an elixir of, of cloud or hill giant strength and take care of your strength all you want. I just don't like to lean into that style of play for everyone because it's kind of 
it creates a very set way to play and i don't think everyone wants to do that so i like to make these builds have a little bit more application across a wider distance um charisma though is going to be our other focus because that's going to scale with the majority of our paladin capabilities and it's going to be a big drawing force for us so that's how we start the game is 12 16 14 16. but when we get to act three namely level 11 level 11 is when we'll have six levels into paladin and five levels into cleric and that fifth level into cleric is going to get us access to spirit guardians and that's when we're going to want to start to do damage as a cleric so what you want to do is get the amulet that sets your constitution to 23. You would get this in the house of hope. It would be the first thing I would recommend you do into act three. Once you jump into the lower city, in which case we would respect this character, sink our constitution and put it into wisdom. So this is what your stat line is going to look like once you've gotten that, that amulet, because your constitution is not going to matter. The amulet automatically sets it to 23. And that is crucial because that's going to be a huge source of hit points. We want this character to have as many hit points as possible. So here's your end game of 12, 16, 14, 16. And if you're in the beginning of the game, you'd start just like that until again, the, the mid to late point of, uh, well, I guess early to mid late point of act three, depending on when you go to the house of hope, but I'd knock that out as fast as possible progression for this character let's go through it so right jumping into level two we're going to choose our fighting style this might come down to you and your preference um i think it really kind of sticks between protection and defense you can go dueling but like i said we're not really too worried about doing extra damage in melee we have other sources of damage later on defense i think is the best call here because it's just an all plus one to your to your armor class while wearing armor and we're always going to be wearing armor so i think it just is the best fit if you want you can be kind of wily and go with protection so when you have a shield impose disadvantage on an attack against your allies when you are within five feet that that works best if you have another frontline fighter you're going to be with so this is going to be up to you and how you want to approach this character and your party build if you have another frontline fighter protection can be really cool because you can lean real hard into that character's offense and not their defense and have this tanky character truly actually be a tank using both protection and warding bond to help them out so I'm going to go defense, though, just to increase my armor class. And for spells, again, you're just going to kind of stick with stuff that's going to make sense for the whole entire party in the build. Compelled duel, though, will be a good one you can use. Force the enemy to attack only you, giving a disadvantage against other targets. Why this is really nice is you're going to have scary targets in the battles you're going to face in this game. You pop this onto it. It is a concentration ability, which does suck. So you're only li you're limited to one concentration ability on at a time, right? But this will be a nice way to allow you to just basically, quote unquote, tank something by effectively taunting them. Gives them disadvantage on any other targets. So they're probably going to want to go towards you instead. Um, but, you know, the smites, while I said they're not too awesome, they're not too terrible at the same time. You can use those in your repertoire. All of these are really fun. I actually really like Wrathful Smite uh, just because it frightens things. But even something like Thunderous Smite doesn't cost a concentration, even though it uses action and bonus action, which is just a bunch of hog swoggle. Uh, but we'll go with something like this. And we'll just kind of keep pushing through these levels. They're all gonna be pretty straightforward. Uh, the spells, I'm not gonna go through every single one. Uh, I want you to really just choose the ones that make sense for the, for the entire party you're gonna deal with. Is this character gonna be primarily your cleric paladin character that's buffing and healing? Then choose those spells accordingly. Like, I don't have Bless on this character because I would assume I'd probably have another cleric that would do that or some other character that's gonna take care of it. So go ahead and just go with what makes sense. But we get divine health here, so we can't be diseased. And we get turn the faithless, so turn nearby fey and fiends, which you're going to deal with quite a bit of in this game. And nature's wrath to restrain an enemy. They cannot move. Attack rolls against them have advantage, which is lovely. And then to level four, we choose more spells, but mainly our new feet. So let's go ahead. Uh, yeah, our, just our new feet. So let's go ahead and go through our feet. As far as your feet selection go, you have some pretty fun ones. And then you also have some pretty sim straightforward ones. It kind of depends on how you want to approach this character. So the easy one here is, of course, going to be ability improvement. Putting into dexterity is going to increase our armor class, but it's also going to increase our initiative. It's an all-around better selection here for you because that's what our finesse weapons are going to be using to scale our damage, right, is dexterity. So this is a good one. My allergies are kicking in, so I can barely breathe out of my damn nose. So let's go down to heavy armor master, our next 
feet. Uh, this is going to, and why this is a good one is that incoming damage from non-magical attacks also decreases by three while you're wearing heavy armor. The plus one to strength is cool and all, but we want that mitigation to damage. Those two are really great options here. Shield Master is always good too. It's going to allow you to basically use a reaction to redu reduce the amount of damage coming your way, uh, your way from a spell. Um, so this is a really good way to go about that if you're using a shield, which you will be using. Another very straightforward one, too, is tough. It's very simple. It's just simply going to add two more hit points for every level you have gained. Depending on what race you went with, too, this can be a ton of hit points, right? If you went with that gold dwarf, you're going to have three points per level more than you would your other counterparts of this build. So go with whatever one makes sense for you. Savage Attacker can be a way to add more melee damage to the build if you really want to lean in that direction. But again, I just don't think that's where this build goes. Now, a fun option is Sentinel. So when an enemy is within melee range, uh, attacks an ally, you use a reaction to make a weapon attack against that enemy. So this would override or at least combat or compete with the one from compete or, uh, protection, right? So you have only one reaction you can make. It's either going to be protect an ally or Sentinel's attack, wh whatever you want to do. But the big thing here is you gain advantage on opportunity attacks, and when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, it can no longer move for the rest of its turn. And you take Sentinel and combine it with Polar Master, because A, you get a bonus action here where you can hit things. Is it not going to show up? There we go. Where you can hit things with your half of your uh, pull arm, and you can actually trigger a smite with that, which is really fun. But there's this right here, the opportunity attack. So you make an opportunity attack when a target comes within range. So this allows you to be this sort of zone controlling tank character that can use a spear and a shield and control an area because anytime anyone comes within range of you, you get an opportunity attack, which you now have advantage on. Just my word of warning here is this is more of an advanced route. So if you're not really comfortable with doing that, please do not take it because you only get two feats in this build. You would take um, Sentinel probably first and then Polar Master or vice versa, depending on which weapon you get first. Like if you get a good spear, go with that. Um, go with Polar Master first. But I think the easiest way to just go with things is ability improvement, two points into dexterity, and then something like Tough or Heavy Armor Master or Savage Attacker, depending on if you want to be more tanky, if you want to have more health, or if you want to just outright mitigate damage. Let's go ahead and put this point in and keep going. Now into level five, we get our extra attack, which is always going to be huge for the character. We jump into our level two spells. Again, just choose the ones that are going to fit for your build. I like magic weapon a lot. It is a concentration ability though. So it will, if you turn this on, you really can't do anything else. But a good fun one is aid because you can cast this and increase the hit points of your party members and you can scale this with your party or your, your, your spell slots. And you're going to have up to level five spell slots. So it's pretty fun. It lasts until long rest. Moving forward, we have level six of our Paladin, and that's when we get Aura of Protection, which is going to scale off of our Charisma. So as it is right now, this will give everyone around us in a 10-foot radius a plus three bonus to their saving throws. And that completes our Paladin. Let's take another level here. And now we pivot here into Cleric. Into Cleric. <laughs> so where the hell is it? And go into the Light Domain. Now, the big thing we want with the light domain is this, Warding Flare. Shield yourself with divine light. Use a reaction to impose disadvantage on an attacker, possibly causing their attack to miss. So, if you can't tell, our reaction is kind of crowded, right? If you went with protection, now you're, now you're vying Warden Flare and protection. If you went with the Polar Master and, and Sentinel, now you're vying three different reactions depending on what the circumstance is. So, just know that going into it. I, I That's why I have... No Sentinel, and I am not using Protection. We're just using the Armor Class bonus and using Warding Flare. And we're going up to level 6 with Light Domain Cleric because we get improved Warding Flare, and we can cast this onto our friends that are taking damage. It is going to be really nice and tanky because this allows you to be kind of that, like, Cecil tank from Final Fantasy 4 slash Final Fantasy 2, depending on which one you're looking at, where you jump in front of someone's blow. Hey, you're about to take a damage. You don't, you aren't going to take it, but you can use Improved Warding Flare to at least help deflect some of that hit. And that's the best thing about it. Cantrips, go ahead and probably go with Guidance. You can go with Blade Ward. Blade Ward's probably, probably pretty good until you get to the later portions of the game, but you have ways to turning this on for your character prior to that. So... Do whatever makes sense. You can go with Sacred Flame if you want a ranged radiant damage ability that almost never ever seems to hit, or Thaumaturgy to gain advantage on intimidation checks, which is can be really fun. 
And then for your spells, this is going to skip be different upon what else is in your party. Do you have another cleric, another druid that's casting divine spells for you? Then, well, maybe you've got that character taking care of stuff like uh, your blesses and stuff like that. But, you know, command's not bad. Shield of faith isn't bad. Having someone to cast sanctuary on another character and not waste that character's uh, spell slots are always really good. So let's just go with something like that. And we'll progress forward with cleric into level two, where we get radiant of the dawn another really big crucial ability and i'm going to go through this in the gear section but we're going to take a lot of the luminous gear and that will allow us to mitigate damage coming our way because we can mitigate it through the radiant orb capability which reduces attack rolls but this allows us to throw it around everything in a 30 foot radius and if if they resist it they still take uh, half damage so this is a massive source of radiant damage for us that we can just trigger whenever we want and we also have our Channel Divinity, which replenishes on Short Rest, which is always going to be lovely. More spells going through that. Push on into level three, where we get our level two spells. Um, big ones here I really like are always going to be Hold Person. Hold Person is always a really good one. Um, again, it's a concentration ability, so keep that in mind. Warding Bond can be good to be cast onto another frontliner. So it's like you two together are just holding the line. You have resistances. You're, well, you're giving that character resistance, bonus to, to uh, saving throws, as well as AC. So this can be a really great way to mitigate two frontline damage dealer or uh, two frontline characters uh, mitigating the damage towards them. Uh, but even something like thought, enhanced ability here, calm emotions is really good for can't be trying to fight in order to become enraged. Um, spiritual weapon is cool. What's kind of nice for this character would be prayer of healing to effectively add a short rest level of heal. Well, kind of a short rest level of heal uh, and not crowd up another character's healing or spell slots. So this is a cool one. But keep in mind, with paladins and clerics, you can just swap these things out. You just press K and you can swap it all out. You, you, swap, you want blindness instead? You can go ahead and do that for that. Uh, specific instance into level four choose a new cantrip we will go with sacred flame just because i want to and we'll get a new feat you know we'll go with tough i want to just get a bunch of health right now we'll show off what that looks like for the character and the level five so this point this is the point where after you would well even before you did this you know right at level 11 you could go to Withers and Respec. You'd want to set your stats to this right here. 12, 18, 8, 8, 14, 16. I know a lot of min-maxers are going to say, why you even have this 12 strength? It's not worth it. Drop this and put it into uh, more wisdom here or, or set up this in a different way. I'm choosing to do it this way. If you don't want to do it and you want to min-max it, then fucking do it. This whole video is meant to guide you into a way to play, but please take all this as inspiration and play the game how you want. Say, you know what? I kind of like the way your stat setup was, but I'm going to do it this way instead. By all means, please do that. I want this to be a way to simply inspire you to play the game in the way that you want to play the game. So now that we've gotten that though, we have our level five capability, which unlocks the biggest portion of damage for us. It's spirit guardians. So now we do radiant or necrotic damage and have the movement speed of things around us. With a higher wisdom, <clears throat> it's harder for things to save against this, right? But they still take half damage when they save against it. And they're always going to have their movement speed halved. So we can keep things in range around us. It's a great way to kind of control the battlefield, and I really like it. We also, as part of our light domain, we're going to get access to Fireball and Daylight, which is actually, Daylight's a super helpful ability. I do like it quite a bit. But Glyph Awarding is a great ability to add into here. Remove Curse is really cool too. I like Revivify. And just think of these things as kind of like, hey, you know what? I already have a character that's doing a lot of the other, like the damage level three spells. Let me use this character to, to lean into all these other ones. And like I said too, you can always just swap these in if you need to in certain situations. Going to our last level here of Cleric. This is going to give us Improve Warding Flare where we throw that reaction onto other characters as they take damage. We get one more shot of Channel Divinity and we get more spell slots. So let's go ahead and take a look at what all this looks like put together. Now having complete everything, you can see that we have a ton of abilities. One of the first things that I want to look at, and it's one of the most important things, are your reactions. You're going to have a ton of them and you really need to take a look at them and make sure you're all set up for them. Um, and of course, you know, stuff like Divine Smite triggering is not a conventional reaction. It's more the game saying, hey, this can happen on these instances. So make sure these little boxes are checked 
so that the game will ask you on critical hits and so on and so forth, hey, did you want to use a corresponding level of Divine Smite with a spell slot? Which brings me to my conversation on that. But um, also improved Warding Flare on here. Make sure that those are all checked. You've got it all. Warding Flare will work for just you. Improved Warding Flare will work externally. But you have up to level five spell slots, which is really cool here. So we can upcast any of our big cool spells. We have a lot of really spell, cool spells that came with just simply being a light cleric too. So we've got stuff like Moonbeam, which we didn't showcase in the leveling process, but that's a really great ability. It's so damn strong. It's just a concentration spell, unfortunately, right? But it's a level two one. So you'll get this before you get Spirit Guardians, which is an awesome one, of course, as well. All that juicy radiant damage. You're going to get access to Scorching Ray, to Flaming Sphere, to Fireball, to Burning Hands. A lot of really great utility here. You've got that hold person command if you want to use a compelled duel like I recommended. All these branding smites and all that action all right here. And you've got all your class actions like lay on hands, which can be, remember, greater heal, a cure, or a lesser heal. Your hands with divine power to heal a target. Um, your healing radiance here, which is going to do 13 hit points, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's free 26 po points of health, basically. it's That's great. Um, and you already you get one charge here from Channel Oath. Uh, you turn the faithless, your nature's wrath, your divine sense, your aura of protection, your smites, of course, and your radiance of the dawn, which is going to do 14 to 32 radiant damage. So all these really great abilities, including all these blue ones down here, of course, blue and purples, depending on what, what they are, like you have just such a great amount of utility built into this, this uh, build that I, I just really, 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 really love. And it's all going to come together in a lot of really cool ways, right? Like since we only went up to level three spells, we still have level five spell slots to do a level five smite, which is nine to 30. Oh, that's the reaction one. I was like, what? what's, what's wrong here? Why are you saying that? <laughs> yeah, nine to 30 right here. Or, you know, if we wanted to, we could cast a uh, spirit guardians. Do that one. That's doing five to 40 radiant damage around us. You know, we have just so many cool capabilities that we can do with this that I really love. Moving into itemization, there are some items that I do not have, so we're going to show them off right now. The very first one that's actually pretty crucial to the build early on is going to be the Hell Rider's Pride. You'll get these in the um, Emerald Grove, and you'll do them by doing the, the, uh, uh, the quest with Zevlor against Kaga. And basically, when you heal another creature, it gains resistance against bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, damage dealt by weapons attack, and a plus one to strength saving throws. The cool thing is... These are going to be useful all the way up until you get the best in slot gloves that we're going to talk about later. If you want to stick with these, you could use the luminous gloves instead, but you've got really three primary gloves you're going to swap between depending on how you want to approach this. But the Hellrider's Pride are so good because they just give you this resistance to other people when you heal another creature. So it's going to be a ton of use for your character. And it's basically giving them blade ward because that's what resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing is going to do. Next up, we have the Holy Lance Helmet, which is great here because Smite the Graceless. Creatures who miss their attack rolls against the wearer must make a dexterity saving throw or take one to four radiant damage, and you get constitution saving throws plus one. This you're going to find in the Mountain Pass, and it's going to go along with another bit of armor. And this kind of leans into the whole Luminous portion of this build, and that's going to go into the, well, Luminous Armor. This is medium armor, not heavy armor but it's still really damn good. You get this right when you walk into the Underdark through the Goblin Camp in Act 1. When the wearer deals radiant damage, like the Holy Lance Helm will do, they cause a radiant shockwave. And that radiant shockwave gives out two radiant orbs to things in a 10 or 30 foot radius. I think it's like a 15. But it's a, uh, it's a certain radius. And those radiant orbs reduce attack rolls by one per turn remaining. So it gives two turns of it. So it's minus two to attack rolls against you. It's really nice. That's not direct tanking, right? It's indirect tanking because you're reducing their ability to hit you. It's damage mitigation. And that is absolutely crucial. And it's really, really strong for this damn build. And the last thing I want to show off here is the Blood of Lathander. Now, this is a strength weapon. But once per long rest, when, you, when your hit points are reduced to zero, you regain two to 12 hit points. Allies within nine meters also regain one to six hit points. This is... Awesome. So it gives you a little bit of health, allows you to stay in the fight longer because you basically get the same thing that, that uh, orcs do, right? That relentless endurance, where if they get down to zero health, they just come back to life with one health. But you, in this case, get two to 12 more health, right? 
gives you a free cast of Sunbeam. You get it early in the game, but you're just not going to do a ton of damage with it because your strength is super low. You could mix things up and go with a higher strength build if you wanted, but it's going to be one of the best weapons you can get just as far as the utility it adds to this build if you're not going to use the Falar Luve that you get in uh, the Underdark. There is actually one more finesse weapon that you should take a look at, and it is called Larithian's Wrath. How do you pronounce it? Uh, and it's a pretty straightforward weapon. It's just simply a longsword that has a special ability to slash out and do thunder damage, which can be really cool if you want to stack reverb. Um, I think Falar Luve is better because it offers a lot of utility to the character, but it's the only other finesse longsword I did want to bring up. Ignore the 1d4 radiant that you see on this picture, because that's kind of part of the Morning Lord's radiance, uh, which is something that you'll get in Act 1 as a buff, but... Uh, it's the only other finesse longsword I wanted to talk about because it's the only other finesse longsword that exists. Jumping into the gear that I do have, though, let's take a look at our weapons. So the best in slot one that you're going to get, well, not even really best in slot, but the one that I like the most is simply going to be, uh, ooh, what happened to my, there we go. <laughs> it's simply going to be the Falar Luve that you get in Act 1. You go to the Underdark, it's right under the Goblin Camp. You can get this pretty damn early in the game and just focus on it for the rest of the game. What I like about it too is the melody capability, which can either be a sing or a shriek. The sing will just simply buff everyone around you with a bless. And then this shriek is really great because it will do thunder damage to things around you. So effective creatures receive an extra 1 to 4 thunder damage whenever they get hit. And they get basically a bane put onto them. Lasts for 5 turns. It's one of the best weapons that's going to support how this character likes to play. And I think it's really good. Some other really cool weapons, too, that you can go with is a sort of life stealing. It is a finesse short sword, but it, on a critical hit, the target takes 10 extra necrotic damage and you get 10 temp hit points. It's a plus two weapon. It's going to serve you just fine as well if you want to lean into more damage. Other short swords, too, are the Crimson Mischief that you'll get in Act 3. This is cool because it adds a lot of piercing damage into the build and focuses on that piercing damage. Even if you want to go with scimitars, you can for this build. So Belm is a great one because it has perfectly balanced strike which is a bonus action to just do another round of damage, basically. And it doesn't require a short rest or anything to do to use again, so it's awesome. And if you want to kind of spike up your um, strength a little bit, you can use the Handmaiden's Mace in Act 3 as well. This does poison damage, and it sets your strength to 18. So that's a really nice capability you can use. If you want to go with that Sentinel build, you can use any of the spears in the game. You can use the Saluna spear. You can use the spear that you find at the very beginning uh, from the crypt. Or you can eventually get into the Halberd of Vigilance, which would drop using a shield, but you gain plus one bonus to initiative rolls and advantage on perception ability checks. When you make an attack roll as a reaction, you make it with advantage. So this gets you a lot of the benefits of um, doing the, the reaction that you get with uh, Sentinel and Polar Master, right? Where it's like, hey, someone in melee range of you within five feet gets attacked. You can do an advantage attack against them. Boom, here you go with the adroit reflexes. It's a really great uh, weapon and it does force damage too, which will lean into a direction of the other items we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. But these are all of the weapons for your uh, build. Let's take a look at your armor now. As far as armor and the rest of your gear goes, you just focus on the things that you're going to find. You can get that luminous armor that we talked about in Act 1, and that can last you as long as you want it to. And what I mean by that is, if you want to lean into that direction of the build, doing all the luminous items, then please take that route. It's a really fun, really cool route. You would then eventually get these luminous gloves. When the wearer deals radiant damage, the target receives two turns of radiant orb. So the target that you hit gets the Radiant Orb, and then you have the Radiant Shockwave that's going to come out and do more Radiant Orbs. So remember, Radiant Orbs, let's take a look at how this works. Minus one to attack rolls for each turn remaining. So in this case, it's a minus two to attack rolls. It's a ton of reductions to attack rolls, keeping you kind of in the fight. So it's a really, really cool capability. And then you'd use this, the Coruscation Ring. When the wearer deals dispel damage while illuminated by a light source, they also inflict Radiating Orb upon the target for two turns. So this allows you to lean into a lot of that capability using that Radiance Dawn here to do all this really cool uh, damage from uh, 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 light sources, or not light sources, from, from Radiant and really kind of leaning into that direction. So you can go that route if you want. I wanted to bring that up before we get to the rest of this gear because it is a cool direction to take. Starting up top at the helmet though, we have the Helm of Balderon. 
And honestly, just use whatever helmet you want to use. The Helm of Balderon has a heal, and that's crucial to this build to trigger things. The helmet heals you for two points at the beginning of every turn. I want I have two items that are going to heal us per turn, so it allows you to flex into replacing one or the other. I often don't like capping or requiring one item into a slot because then it makes the build a little less flexible. So you can go with the Helm of Balderon here to get you that healing. You have stun immunity. You can't be crit hit as well. And you have a plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws. It really it really leans into the character. Um, you can go too with a lot of the other helmets as well that I unfortunately didn't put aside over here. But Flawed Helldusk Helmet, you'll get in Act 2. And I think you could use this for the majority of the game. Or even the Grimscale Helm is a really, really good one that allows you to dodge being crit as well as getting resistant to fire damage. Those are two really awesome alternatives that you can go with that lean into the direction of this build. Also to the Helmet of Smiting, you'll get this at the same place you get the Luminous Armor. So when you apply Condition with one of your Smite spells, you gain 10 hit points equal to your Charisma Fodder modifier. I'd probably use this helmet until I got the Grim Skull, and then until I got the Flawed Helldusk helmet, and then swap between these two. Then you get this in Act 3. Next up, we have our Cloak. And Cloak is the Cloak of Protection, but you can go with another really good one here is the Cloak of the Weave. You take advantage, don't take advantage of the, the AC bonus and spell attack rolls until you're that like level 11 cleric where you're leaning into your level three um, spells. But you can also go with the Cloak of Displacement too to get a disadvantage on attack rolls to make you very, very hard to hit without actually having to use your AC, which is cool. Well, you use quote unquote. So this gives you a lot of cool bonuses to your AC and saving throws. This is like actual cool mitigation with disadvantage on attack rolls. And it's awesome to be to effectively have blur cast on you at the start of combat. Now into your armor, use whatever heavy armor you want. Use that luminous armor we talked about. Uh, you can use the adamantine heavy armor. The I think it's a, what is this? It's, yeah, it's adamantine splint mail. So the all damage would be reduced by two rather than one and reeling for three turns other than two. But you still get the attackers can't land critical hits on the wearer, which is awesome. And it has more AC. But another really good one, though, is the Dwarven Splint Mail, which you buy in Act 3 as well. Take one less piercing damage. You have a bonus on strength saving throws, plus two to your constitution here, up to 20, right? So I wouldn't be able to stack this with this amulet, as you can see. Um, we'll get to the armor I'm wearing in a sec. And then always there's the armor of persistence, which is probably the best heavy armor in the game that you just can buy. All incoming damage reduced by two. You gain resistance and blade ward. It's just always on your character. It's probably that best in slot kind of just like, hey, here's just really good heavy armor. But I've gone a specific direction with this character that I really like. It's fun and unique. It's the rippling force mail. You gain force conduit when taking slashing, piercing, or bludgeoning damage. And this allows me that every turn um, I'm going to, I'm sorry, the way this works is it stacks up to five. And once you reach five or more, it deals one to four radiant damage in a 20 foot radius. And we're going to see how we can stack this up even further. So basically, as we take damage, we gain these force conduit stacks to then explode force damage around us. And I really, really like that. I think it's a really cool, fun, crunchy, thematic way to play this build. Into our gloves, we are using the reviving hands, which are absolutely the best in slot for this because we want heals to be reactive. We want those these reactive heals to do something. So when you heal a creature, this is just like Zevlor's gloves, uh, it gains the effect of Blade Ward, just like Zevlor's gloves. And when you revive a creature, it gains the effect of Death Ward. You get a free revivify and strength saving throws plus one. It is totally crucial for the build to kind of fit into the, the overall uh, approach we're taking. But some other ones you're going to get early are stuff like the Gloves of Heroism. When you use your Channel Oath, you gain Heroism, which is really good, and that's going to last you for a long time into this build. Stick with those if you want. If you want to lean into more damage, you can get the Gloves of the Masters. Did you get an Act 3? I think they're on Gale right now, actually. Nope. Nope, they're not. They're not. They're not. <laughs> the worst video in the world. Don't come to my channel. It's just nothing but shit. Here it is. Nope, that's not either. Ah, remember when I used to know how to make videos and I just don't know how to do how that? There it goes. Legacy of the Masters. You gain a plus two bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls with weapons. And you can just buy these at the beginning of Act 3 if you want to get more damage online with your character. But going back into this, if you also want to lean into more of the uh, strength, you can go with the Gaunt Gauntlets of Heal Giant Strength. It's not the overall role of the character, but I wanted to put them here so you can see that they exist. Next up, we have some boots, and I have the Boots of Persistence. 
You gain freedom of movement and long shredder. It's just always on the character. It fits really cool. It's thematic. They look awesome. You can also go though to an early game with spider step boots, just so you can't be uh, in webbed. Your movement suit is not affected by web surfaces, which you'll use pretty well. But right in act one as well, you get disintegrating night stalkers, which are so good. And also stuff like the boots of aid and comfort. When the wearer heals a target, it gains additional three temp hit points. Those become obsolete very quickly because three temp hit points is such a small amount and it doesn't stack. So it's a nice thing in the very beginning of the game, but I would just go with any kind of mobility boots until you get these persistent boots. Now, into your shield options, which I haven't gone into, I'm using Viconia's Walking Fortress right now because it looks cool in this portrayal. Uh, use your reaction to deal two to eight force damage and knock it prone. That's a really great capability. You get Reflective Shell, which is really good. Uh, you get Warding Bond bound into this. You gain advantage on saving throws against spells. Spell attack rolls against you have disadvantage. All really good stuff. It, it is really awesome for the build. But my best in slot choice is actually this. Spires or Swires Sledboard. The shield of shrouds the wearer with force conduit at the start of its turn in combat. So I immediately start with stacks of force conduit. So I can immediately get that online. And this allows me to stack it up for rippling force mail to have these explosions of force happen around me after I take X amount of damage. Remember, force is the least resisted damage type in the game. This is a, this is a personal flavor choice of mine. Is it the min-max option? No, it's probably Viconia's Walking Fortress, but it now requires you to do the House of Grief, and that kind of sucks. Other really good ones, though, are Kethric Shield. It helps you out with all of your, your cleric capabilities. Uh, Adamantine Shield is always really nice. It's very early in the game that you get it, so it lasts you for a long time. The Shield of Shielding is good because it just gets you shield. The character now just has shield, so you can have that on the character, which is always really, really good as well. Into your jewelry. The best one you really want to focus on Amulet of Greater Health. It's kind of like a non-negotiable, more or less, unless you really want to squeeze Dex into this character. I'm sorry, Constitution into this character some way, shape, or form. <clears throat> I didn't want to, so that's why I went with Amulet of Greater Health. Advantage on Constitution saving throws is nice, too, because that's going to affect your uh, Spirit Guardians. As well, though, you can use the Amulet of Restoration early in the game for extra sources of free healing. Amulet of Missy Step to just get a, a mobility ability or face semblance amulet if you want disadvantages on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws to help it so you can't get locked down as you leave by stuff like Charm Person and the such. Our ring is going to be the Ring of Regeneration, which you'll get in Act 2 or 3. At the beginning of your turn, the ring activates and heals you. So non-negotiables type thing is either this ring or this helmet. You just need something to trigger every turn because this triggering is going to then trigger these. When you heal a creature, it gains the effect of Blade Ward. So it just keeps you stacked up on Blade Ward so that you always have that active on the character. And then also, the Whispering Promise, when you heal a creature, it gains 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws. So the ring or the helmet makes Blade Ward and Bless always present on your character every turn. That's one of the best things about this gear setup. Uh, you can go with stuff like Crusher's Ring or stuff like that until in the meantime, but you're going to want to follow fall somewhere on this setup to make it so that it works the best for you. Let's put it all together and take a look at some combat. And one last item I forgot to show off is the Amulet of the Devout. You gain plus two bonus to a spell save DC, and you can use an additional channel divinity charge. So this can be a really nice one to add in, but I still think the Amulet of Greater Health is, is way too important, but I did want to show this off if you want to somehow squeeze more constitution onto the character. So jumping into combat, let's show everything off. And right as we jumped into combat too, you can see that we healed for a hit point and two hit points because of our helmet and our ring, which gave us force conduit is because of the shield, but this gave us blade ward and bless. So we just have these already active. And the point of this isn't to show off tons of damage, right? But show off all the utility. So I've used a potion of sw uh, swiftness, of speed, to give me an extra action right now. So if you're wondering why that exists. And we have 191 health because I had Shadow Heart cast uh, aid onto me. So we have 25 more health than we would. And just to show too, we have 24 AC right now as well because we are hastened. This would typically just be 22 AC, just to let that be known as well. Just, you know, transparency. So let's just kind of start off. Let's just do some things that we can do. Um, we'll just do Spirit Guardians, and we'll go ahead and just jack this bad boy up. We'll go ahead all the way to level... Well, I, I don't want to kill anything right now. <laughs> Let's, you know, we're just going to do level 3 one. Because the point of this character is to show off the damage that we can take. So we got Spirit Guardians tricking on. And what I'm also going to do is, 
Um, I before I even d had done that, I could have done something like a Moonbeam, and then cast Spirit Guardians. So like, oh, I'll just do the damage here. Moonbeam requires concentration, so you would at least do the damage and then swap back. But Moonbeam could be jacked up to level five and do five to fifty, and just a ton of radiant damage. But since our big focus isn't on showing off what the damage this character can do in melee, while well, they still can do damage, right? This is still going to do seven to fourteen damage that I can then uh, spice up with a um, smite. We're just not going to focus on that right now. And also keep in mind too, the Fallor Luve Melody here. You notice anything when you look at that? It doesn't say concentration. So the sword itself is what's actually doing the singing and everything, not me. So I can have this up and actually have Shriek up too. Um, so this will now do the radiant damage plus also thunder damage, which can stack with any kind of uh, uh, reverberation build. Let's just do Radiance of Dawn. I just want to do a big AoE shot of this. Now, if I had Luminous Armor, this they would all have their Radiant Orbs on. All sorts of fun action. And we're also going to do, just to kind of show off some of the utility, I'm going to stand right here since we, I know, I know that's going to happen. We have our, uh, yeah, just trick off some more of that. We've got our Healing Radiance, right? So I'm going to do this to help out Gale here. Now he has Blade Ward and he has Bless. That's great. Let's end this turn. And you're just going to sit there, Gale. Sit there and look pretty. Okay, the shove has been resisted. And he's going to attack me. I'm going to use Warding Flare. So now, now he missed, which he was going to hit me before. My AC is just stacked to the roof. And I, unfortunately, oh, that didn't let me do improve Warding Flare there, too. Weird. I don't know why that... Oh, I already used my reaction. That's why, duh. <laughs> I like, what? Where's my other warding player? And unfortunately, he's taking a lot of damage, but my point too is to show that I can take damage and I can also keep him alive at the same time, just simply by, by being here. I have 188 health at a 191 right now. They've healed themselves up. And this is different. Usually I always show all this damage this character can do. Uh, just don't reflect, don't react right now. Let, let, it, let, let the boy watch. And there we go. Boom. Another splash of damage from my, um, what's this thing called? From Spirit Guardians. And we hit everyone around us. And I'm back to full health. Gale is not at full health, but he's pretty close with 162 out of 168. And we both have Blade Ward back up. And we both have Bless back up. So we're in the fight. You notice too that no one's really taking tons of damage because Blade Ward is resist. Resistance against bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage. And if you look at my Force Conduit, it's now at 5. If the Entity takes damage while it has 5 or more turns remaining, it deals Force Damage. So let's see if we can do this. I don't... This might not work. Okay. Alright. This could work. This could work. <laughs> okay, let's do that. I thought this up on the fly. We're going to see how this works. Now, end turn. And... um. I could do more stuff here, right? We could do healing. We could do other sorts of things. Remember, you know, I've got my I've got my four charges of lay on hands, so I could heal someone in a bind if I need to, or even do a lesser one to kind of make it last longer. Um, we've got other stuff we can do in these situations here, but I'm just gonna hang tight to show off some of that uh, that force damage because it's pretty cool and it triggers. Oh, of course he would do that. What a jerk. Yeah, he's like, I don't even know. I don't even know what that other guy is. There we go. I got. I'll do a warding flare just to you know show off the tankiness. But I just want to get hit one more time. Maybe I should have done that warding flare. There we go. Now that's the force explosion. It doesn't do a ton of damage, but I like the idea of just all these sources of AOE damage that trigger on turn or on activation from me. So I'm constantly able to just kind of sit in the thick of it, do damage to stuff around me, whatever the situation is. And there we go again, that thing exploded with more radiant damage and I'm up to 181 out of 191. Unfortunately, I'm incapacitated because of the, uh, the potion here, but still, this shows off how tanky this character can be. 
And while direct tanking isn't necessarily a thing in this game, like I said before, it's still showing you here how you can have a lot of fun with this and do a lot of cool things. And you don't necessarily need to be this character doing all the damage, but you can be enough of a harassment to things around you that you're supplementing everything else. All these guys are moving so much slower. And if they want to get to anyone else, they're going to have to, you know, go through me. And if I had the Sentinel and uh, Polar Master situation going on here, then they would have to stop as soon as they come into my aura here and get dealt damage and have to get locked down through the opportunity attack situation, which you only allow one per turn, but still. There's a lot of really cool ways you can do things with this build. And I think it's a really cool way to do a tank in Alder's Gate 3, which doesn't have conventional tanking methods. So if you have cool ways to approach this that maybe I didn't talk about, say, hey, you know what? The six light clerics got some cool gimmicks to it, but I really think you should go with this instead. Maybe it's a ton of knight, uh, Eldritch Knight levels to have a tons of stacks of um, shield, whatever it is. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Hopefully this gives you a good idea on how to build out a tank, but have a good one and take care.